Are you looking for wisdom, courage, and guidance on your journey as a change maker? Grab your headphones, a warm drink, and possibly a notebook. You're going to want to take notes. You've found your new favorite podcast. Welcome to Become a Good Ancestor, a podcast hosted by Layla Saad. Layla is a New York Times and Sunday Times bestselling author, an international speaker, and a globally respected teacher on the topics of race, identity, leadership, personal transformation, and social change. In each episode, Layla interviews some of the world's most inspiring authors of color who are changing the world with their words. From memoirs to manifestos, poetry to pop culture, science to social justice, and everything in between. Join Layla as she dives deep with BIPOC authors who are showing us the way to healing and liberation. This is a place for people who want to help change the world, in honor of those who have come before us, and in service to those who will come after we are gone. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rima Zaman. I am the author of the memoir, I Am Yours, and the forthcoming novel, Paramita, A Dystopian Matriarchy. And I have also the honor of being the book club facilitator for Become a Good Ancestor. And today I am joined by, I am joined by the CEO and founder, Leila Saad of Become a Good Ancestor. And Leila is also, as you know, the New York Times bestselling author of Me and White Supremacy. Welcome, Layla. I am so excited to be speaking to you today. Thank you. I'm so excited that we're doing this. This is an exciting thing. You know, I've been podcasting since 2015, but this is the first time that I'm ever doing a live experience. Um, and it's been a while since I've been interviewed on the podcast itself. Um, so this is this is exciting for me, and I couldn't choose a better conversation partner to have than you, Rima. So thank you for agreeing to do this, and I'm, I'm really excited to be <laughs> having this conversation with you. Um, I also want to give a shout out and thanks to our team at Become a Good Ancestor, um, specifically uh, Kim David, our chief marketing officer who supported so much with helping us bring this together. I want to shout out Toy, our um, uh, customer support um, member. I want to shout out Brittany, our online business manager, and so many other people. And I also want to give a very specific shout out to a woman who has helped us to rebrand and relaunch this podcast. So the person I'm talking about is Hannah Pillow, who is our podcast producer. She has helped us to plan and script this episode. Um, she is truly a woman who has claimed her space in her work. She is the founder of Wild Fi Wildfire Purpose Podcast Production Company and has been you know, key to the rebranding and relaunch of the podcast. Hannah's purpose and mission is to amplify the voices of women entrepreneurs through her work and become an advocate for a greater change. So it's such a pleasure to get to work with Hannah. If you are interested in finding out more about her and her work, you can visit wildfirepurposeproduction.co.uk. Wonderful. Thank you, Layla. Thank you for those shout outs. And yes, Hannah and her team are incredible. Um, I wanted to start with your beautiful timeline. So in 2017, you wrote a wildly, massively viral blog post called I Need to Talk to White Spiritual Women About White Supremacy. Sorry, Spiritual White Women About White Supremacy. And it res resonated with so many people and went viral all over the world. That led to 2018 when you created the Me and White Supremacy Instagram Challenge, which became a movement where hundreds of thousands of people began, began to interrogate their relationship with white supremacy. Naturally, that segued into January 2019 when you launched your uh, worldwide known, worldwide renowned um, Good Ancestor podcast, amplifying BIPOC authors and change makers. And I've had the honor of being on that podcast. Yes. And then in 2020, January, you published Me and White Supremacy, and it spread your anti-racism work even further around the world. And then in April 2020, you launched Become a Good Ancestor, which is where inner work meets social change. And you have pivoted from primarily anti-racism work 
directed towards a white audience to supporting change makers of every kind to find their right work to create lasting change and how to take care of ourselves through this process. So I am so excited to talk to you about your journey, your backstory and how it led to your present moment, and especially to shine a spotlight on your new self-study course, which is called Claim Your Space. Uh, So let's start with the backstory. Okay, so your evolution from life coach to writer. So the Become a Good Ancestor podcast, Rite of Passage. Who are some of the ancestors living or transitioned, familial or societal, who have influenced you on your journey? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, great question, Rima. Um, I ask it. (laughs) We do the the podcast. It's how we start. It's how we start, right? And it's so important mm-hmm. to be grounded in like the past and who we come from, who's influenced us, how they've influenced the way that we show up in the world. So I always start with my parents because they've had a huge influence in who I am, how I see myself, how I show up in the world, the lessons that I pass on to my own children. Um, and I just really want to acknowledge and give gratitude to them for um, for everything that they give, they've given m- me and my brothers and all of our children, so all of their grandchildren, mm-hmm. um, they have taught us so much. You know, I was just saying to them recently on our family WhatsApp group, you know, hey, you guys, I just realized like you've been married 40 years. And my dad corrects me and he's like, it's actually 41 years. And, um, <laughs> you know, I'm like, here's to many more. And I, I really thank them for giving all of us, their children, a model of partnership and love and relationship that is so beautiful to have that is echoed in my own relationship with my husband, who is just like my biggest team member, my biggest cheerleader and just best friend. Um, and, and also everything that they've instilled in me about excellence and character and, you know, integrity and a lot of the work that I do in Become a Good Ancestor, and it's funny because my mom, a lot of the time she doesn't really get what I do. <laughs> she does, she's, she's like, I don't get what is deep and what does that right. mean? What does what claim your space? What does that mean? But truly, mm-hmm. actually, it was both my parents who taught my brothers and I that you know, you're not just here for your own benefit. It's also important to be enhancing other people's lives and supporting other people. Um, and so that's been baked into me, right? It's, it's, it's a seed that's been planted in me. Right. And I'm, I just want to thank and acknowledge them for that. Um, I also want to acknowledge my grandparents on both sides and, you know, putting whatever they put into their children that it then gets passed down to me as well. And then from a societal level, I'm very influenced by um, Black feminist writers, um, both past and present. Um, you know, a lot of the well-known ones, so Audre Lorde, you know, Bell Hooks, Toni Morrison, um, uh, Sonia Sanchez, you know, Lucille Clifton, and so many others. And Just the, I think what I take away from it is that each one of us, it's our, it's our, it's our, both our privilege and our responsibility to show up fully as ourselves, loving ourselves. And from that place, really, really being able to support other people as well and bringing together community that is authentic and that is about practicing love. Um, and so that's where I root kind of my thought leadership in. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing mm-hmm. that, Layla. And I, I mean, it, it makes so much sense that the, all of your influences and inspirations were to, we're all people of love mm-hmm. and role modeling how through love we create social change and it begins at home and how you have created now a safe space and a safe home and haven for so many other people to create their social change and find their voice and you celebrate yeah, that I love that and live that and yeah and whenever you so generously share parts of your story and parts of your family story with us it helps just cement that further for us and especially yeah. the way that you know, Sam shows up for you. And whenever you um, generously show photos from your life with your children, it's so evident. 
I'm just here for love. That's it. <laughs> That's what I'm yeah, here it's a for. legacy of love. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's very, yeah. it's, it's, it's very resonant. We feel it. And I think that's a huge part of why people want to be part of anything you create. Mm, thank you. Because it's so authentic. It thank you. I take that thank in. You. I receive that. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, so I wanted to go back to the very beginning um, of when your anti-racism work first became public and the article you wrote, which is, I need to talk to white, uh, spiritual white women about white supremacy. And were you always a writer or did you transition from another uh, background? And what motivated you to write this? I think I was always a writer, like in, in my heart, in the way that I feel like being a writer for me is my God-given gift as opposed to something that I trained in or have an academic background in. It was just who I am, but it took me a really long time to recognize it, accept it, own it. Um, you know, I talked about my husband, you know, he was the first person in my life that was like, I think this is what you're here to do. I think you're here to write. And I was like, no, I'm here to be a life coach. That's what I'm here to do. And, you know, years later, I'm like, you were right. <laughs> right. right. But I, in terms of like the actual um, career uh, path that I took, it was like many people, um, it wasn't a straight line. It was me trying out many different things. I studied law as my undergraduate degree. Um, did not enjoy it, came out of that uh, very clear. I didn't want to be a lawyer, but not clear what I wanted to do. Quite by chance, ended up working in corporate tax and did that for five years. Felt like this is something I could do in the same way that you could do, um, I don't know, just anything where you're like, yeah, sure, I can learn the skills of how to do this, but my heart isn't in it in any way. Um, and I think it was when I got married that, like I said, I had that first affirmation of, I think you're here to do something else. And it was like confirming something mm -hmm. inside of me that knew that, but didn't know how to claim it. Um, right. And so then I decided to um, get trained, get training in coaching, in life coaching. And, uh, and then, and so the, and where that came from was I had struggled with depression and anxiety in, in university. And what helped me essentially save myself from that was personal growth books and CDs. And in those times, we didn't really know what coaching was. It wasn't very widespread. And especially here in Qatar, where I was living. And mm -hmm. so it was like, I want to do this thing called coaching. And my parents are kind of like, what are you talking about? You have this amazing right. corporate job right? In tax. Right. Um, what is this thing? And I'm like, I just want to mm -hmm. help people. <laughs> I just want to make right. the world a better place. Right. And they were like, no, like go do your job. Right. So <laughs> it, yeah. it took a while, but I really was like, no, I'm going to invest in this training. I'm going to, you know, do this work. I also was very interested in learning how to get good at public speaking. So I started investing time and energy into that and slowly ended up transitioning myself out of corporate tax into, um, into kind of part-time one-on-one -on -one coaching very early on. I, it didn't sustain for long because I was, I just didn't have resources and support, but the job that I ended up moving into was corporate soft skills training. So leading trainings, workshops in companies on things like interpersonal skills and time management and things like that. But I would sneak coaching into it. So I was like to giving these right. trainings in companies, but then I was also like sneaking this like personal growth leadership stuff into what I was teaching. Yeah. Um, that wasn't in the curriculum that we were supposed to be delivering, but I it just where it was going. Mm -hmm. um, I I did that for I did that part time for about a year or two, and then as an introvert, it was very draining. It's very draining leading two, three, four days of um, full day workshops. You know, eight to 12, 14 people, 
And you have to hold that energy and you have to have, hold a very high level of energy for the entire day. And I essentially just ended up burning out. Like it just, it wasn't sustainable for me. Um, and before I knew how to pull myself out, my body pulled me out because it just shut down one day. And so um, I stopped doing that. And then I tried to find other things to do and ended up working in, I ended up studying health coaching because I was receiving health coaching and I was interested to mm -hmm. learn about that. And I did some work around that. And then I ended up in what was my last job ever, which was working at a nonprofit in their marketing department. And I ended up leading that department um, just before I left. So I ended up becoming the marketing manager there. And in all of these different things that I was trying, I was just, I was trying to find like, what's my thing? Because I can't seem to find satisfaction in anything that I'm doing. It would feel interesting for a while. And then I just would flop and feel like this isn't the thing. And then one day at this job, that was my last job. It was like, I went into work and I had this moment of like floating outside of my body and looking down at myself and thinking, this isn't it. And you know what it is, which is that you're here to have an impact in a big way. And you're almost 30 and you haven't even gotten started on that path yet. And if you don't do something about it now, you're going to be 40 and you're going to be in great regret. Um, so very soon after that, I think a few months after that, um, I quit and embarked on this journey of uh being a solopreneur, being self-employed. I started life coaching, supporting women entrepreneurs who were trying to build purposeful, meaningful, values-aligned businesses. And um, that was great. I really loved it. But essentially what ended up happening was my writing ended up like somehow going viral. So I would write things right. that I felt strongly about and then it would go viral. And I would be like, mm -hmm. Oh, I think this is actually more what I'm supposed to be doing, you know, right. and, and what I found, you know, is that actually what I'm here for, it's not even so much about like the vehicle, like it's not so much about, is it writing or is it coaching or is it speaking? It's more about what is the overall umbrella of what I'm here to do. And that I believe is healing work. And I yes. believe, you know, where I am now is that I have this best-selling book, I have this podcast, I do speaking engagements, and of course I have this beautiful business and we have courses that are here um, that we're sharing with people. And all of it is about healing, is about liberation. And whatever I continue to do for the rest of my life, whether it fits, I decide, you know what, I want to become a mindfulness teacher or I want to like, you know, do whatever it is, like whatever path I go down, whatever next modality I choose to get training in, my work will always be about healing. That That's what I'm here to do. That's beautiful. Thank you. I can see the clear thread, the narrative through line through it too. We can always it, see it burnout. looking back, but when you're right, yeah, when you're in it, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. But when you look back, you're like, right. oh right, yeah, and and that you know you you struggled with anxiety and depression in college, and that led you to self empowerment books and self healing books, and then of course you know it's it's interesting. It's almost like you 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 have so many talents and skills that could have very well given you a, a you know a a satisfying career elsewhere, but it yeah. kept on being called to purpose. And the ultimate purpose being that you are going to use all of these skills, whether it's marketing or leadership or running a business, all in service of healing and liberation and restoration. So it all makes sense. Absolutely. So you found this beautiful alignment. And, and again, I hear that that's all of the things you just touched upon is also the things that you offer in the self-study courses, whether it's deep in or claim your space. So it just makes you are, you are, it's like you workshopped all of those things on your own, on your own, on your own self. And then you fine tuned and perfected everything and are now offering these things to everyone else. Because what I do know is that the thing, you know, it's um, that beautiful quote uh, from Casey Lehman, which is um, we are the second person feeling this pain. We are always the second person mm. feeling our pain, something like that. Yeah. And, you know, um, mm. 
to know that you have had service in one other person's life is to know that you've lived a life worth living. That's the accumulation of why we're even here. So thank you. And um, yeah, and it just, it makes so much sense. that okay, So when you, and I love that you were like, oh yeah, I, re- I kept on writing and they went accidentally viral. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> right. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, oh, obviously there was a need for your voice and this particular way you were delivering that message. It was like the perfect storm of timing and content mm. and the person de- delivering the message. I think mm. those three things go into something becoming viral or massively popular. And Absolutely. I've seen that in your in your posts, on your Instagram posts, in your challenge, the Instagram challenge, and certainly in your amazing book. And um, so that was my next question, which is how did you evolve all of this into me and white supremacy? I mean, it seems pretty, pretty like a simple evolution, but I'd like to yeah. know how, what, what came for, like, what for you was the kernel of like, oh, this is how I'm going to package it or, or um, shape it. This is the container it will hold. Yeah. So I, I used to say that, um, there's no way to like predict or engineer something going viral, but I think now in 2022, that is not the case. I think people know how to like make those things meet each other and create things that go viral, but that doesn't necessarily mean if something has gone viral, that it is meaningful. Like um, we have so many different trends at the minute of things that will go viral, but they're kind of like flash in the pan moments, but they're not necessarily something that has a deep, deep impact or that is intended to, to be that it might just be entertaining right. or just um, mm-hmm. designed to be purposely provocative or whatever the case may be. And for something to remain evergreen too. Yes. I can absolutely tell you, Rima, that I had no intention or desire or design to go viral. Um, That was not where I was coming from. Uh, I also wasn't ready for it. Um, I think something that people don't talk about is we have this um, belief sometimes like, oh, if I go viral, that will be amazing. Then I'll have more business. I'll have more followers. I'll have... And we're not prepared for what happens to you emotionally when you go from being, you know, okay, the people around me know who I am to suddenly hundreds of thousands of people know who you are and want to pick you apart and want to scrutinize you and, you know, say all kinds of things about you and have expectations and assumptions about you that are um, not true and who don't know how to hold you with care. And so it's... um, it's quite an intense experience and I was not prepared for it. And so I have never tried to do that and I wouldn't want to either because it just, right. it's a lot. It's just a lot. But the thing about me and white supremacy that still amazes me is that I didn't, I, I didn't do it. It was done through me. Mm. You know, it it was a thing that was done through me because, you know, I've shared my um, experience with you and nowhere in that experience did I say, oh, yes. And then I, I got a master's in like, you know, decolonization and, you know, critical race theory, or I went and did this course about, you know, white supremacy culture or whatever. That was not my background, right? It never has been. I never want to claim it. I'm not a historian. I don't have that background. I had my own experiences and I had my own thoughts and feelings that I felt very strongly about that I wanted to share. So that's how we got the viral article. Um, From the viral article came all of this attention And then I observed and I observed what I was seeing and I observed over time that people would become more comfortable with these conversations around race and white supremacy. And then I had my curiosity of, okay, what shifted? Like what have they learned about themselves and white supremacy? And I believe that those things, when they come to you of like, oh, that's interesting or a curious moment, when we choose to like follow that thread and see where it leads, very miraculous things can happen. And so this Instagram challenge, which I've talked about in several interviews before, which came to me whole, wholly packaged already, it was like a download, right? Where it was like, 
I want to share this post about asking people what they've learned about themselves and white supremacy. And then, oh, okay, what do I mean by white supremacy? Let me break down some of the terms. And then deciding, okay, maybe this isn't one post. Maybe it's a series of posts. Hey, I know. Let me share it over the course of a month. We can start tomorrow. It, and that happens within the space of an hour or so. Amazing. At 2 a.m. at night, the night before we begin the challenge, right? Like, I, I, I truly believe that there are moments in time when something will come to us and we have a choice on whether we choose to go on that, like, um, what do they call it in the hero's journey? The call to adventure? The call. Mm -hmm. The right? adventure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We hear the call and then we can decide, hey, yeah, I want to go on this adventure or no, I don't. And there was just something yeah. inside of me that was like, keep pulling on this thread. This is, this is important. And I remember we did day one of me and white supremacy on Instagram, this is 2018. And the first question was, what is white privilege? And I give a short explanation of what it was. And then I invited people to comment in the comments about their own understanding of their white privilege. And as, as soon as I started seeing the comments of what people were writing, I was like, oh, oh, wow. Uh, I think I may have just tried to eat an elephant. Like I've just <laughs> taken on a humongous task. And I don't think I have recognized how big this thing is. And That's in that in that moment, I, I, the, part of me was like, you don't have to do this. You know, you can, you can decide that you don't have to do this. And then there was another part of me that said, something very important is happening here. You need to pay attention and you don't have to know everything of what's going to happen next, but it's very important that you show up faithfully to this work um, and, and, and steward it. You need to steward this moment. And so my one job that I have felt throughout my journey with me and white supremacy, whether it was the Instagram challenge, the workbook, which went viral, and then the published book, even the young readers edition, right? And the journals at every stage, all I have thought is this is coming through me. This is not me. I'm not doing this. This is being done through me. And my only job is to allow myself to be used for this work, right? Uh, that's that's my one job that I'm, this is the assignment mm. that I've been called into. And at no point was I like, oh, I'm being forced to do it, or mm. this is something that I don't have say or agency in. It yeah. felt more like, I'll use the terms that I use because I, you know, I believe in God. So that's the languaging that I would use is I felt God was like, this is something that I'm calling you to do. You don't have to do it if you don't want to, but if you want to, let's go. Right. And, and so I did and I did. And what has been really fantastic about this whole thing, Rima, is also knowing when the assignment was done. Right. And I knew the assignment was done last year, 2021. It was the end of 2020. So the Young Readers Edition came out last year. I finished that, published it. We did the whole promo for that. And I was like, there's nothing more that I need to do with this work. I have completed the assignment. I have done everything that was asked of me to the best of my ability with all the love and care I could in the world and it's complete. And that's such a good feeling to know as well. That's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. So you you are the container and the challenge. The container and the ch the channel of the challenge. Yes. And um and you, we got we get to experience that through you. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, I'm done with the assignment, but the work is not done in the world. And I know that it will continue to, because it's not me doing it, it will continue to have whatever impact it's supposed to have out in the world with whoever it's supposed to meet, right? And I'll certainly, sh I'll certainly, you know, I, I also think it's very important not to say, well, I'm done with that. So I never want to think about it again. Never want to speak about it. No, that's my baby. Like that's, that's something I poured years of my life into. 
and it will always be a part of who I am. But f- there's a difference between there's a difference between not abandoning our journey and not abandoning a body of work that we've built versus trying to continue doing it because you feel like you should. Right. 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 Beyond the point of like when you should, and you're just like, no, but I I can't leave it because I have to keep going. And I was like, when I start doing that, no, everything gets scrambled inside of me. (laughs) Like I can't do this. Yeah. And you've, you answered the call and -hmm. you brought it to fruition and it's what you're talking about. You're, you're using the same languaging of, you're talking about a relationship. Yeah. You had a relationship with this body of work. And you brought it to fruition, and now it lives on in the world as this, as this evergreen message and a workbook. You know, you created a workbook. You created a step by step journey for people to follow, and that is, like you said, like you did everything you were told, you were asked to do, and now it lives on in the hands of other people as they go through the journey. Yes. It's really beautiful. And so that naturally, once you, and I'm fascinated by not only did you know that this was the work, you knew its completion and you didn't hold on to it from any kind of scarcity mindset or the fear of not having something else to go on to. Yeah, Yeah. that's what it is. It's you, because you had such faith in the work, you also had faith in the moment when you knew it was complete. Absolutely. Faith is exactly the right the, the right word. Faith is the mm-hmm. right word um, because I'm very much a faith led person and leader, and that's how I that's how I show up. So I recognize, for me, my 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 beliefs are that it's important for us to show up for the work, and it's also equally important for us not to think that only. Only we know everything of what it's going to look like, right? And I think it's so important to leave moments open for spontaneity, for miracles, for things that are, you know, opportunities, luck, grace, things that we can't, again, engineer or predict, but they just show up and you're, and again, you're like, okay, this thing has shown up, like, what do I want to do with it? And that piece around agency is very important to me, that we always Mm -hmm. have a choice. We don't have to go on every adventure that we're called into, you know? Right. Because without agency, you don't have authenticity, right? The authentic yes or the authentic no. And so that's, yeah, they're hand in hand. Yeah, right there. Um, That's so fascinating and so beautiful. And it makes so much sense to me that then once you knew that part of your work had been complete naturally the next part that came to be was become a good ancestor dear good ancestor are you feeling inspired by our guests amazing work towards creating social change you're probably here because you're passionate about fighting the isms you know the ones racism sexism classism and ableism to name just a few You're here to do the work that matters. And as important as that work is, I know it can also be exhausting. Trust me, I've been there too. Here's what I've learned. When we want to fight social injustice and build a better world, we tend to lead with a burning passion. And this can also lead to burnout and a vicious cycle of feeling like we're not doing enough. That's why I created Claim Your Space, our course that sets you up to be a powerful change maker without compromising rest and joy. It took me a long time to be able to claim my space in creating social change. And I want to support you in claiming your own space and help you do the work in a way that is right for you. Are you ready to start making a difference in a sustainable and joyful way? To start your journey, sign up for Claim Your Space at becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash claim dash your dash space. I want to to ask you, what did the experience of writing and promoting me and white supremacy, what did it teach you about your own journey as a a good ancestor? And um, 
and how, cause I feel like we touched on the burnout and, and anxiety and depression. You felt that in your college years that then um, led you to seek a life of life coaching for yourself and then to become one. Did you have a similar kind of turnaround or, or turning point to the promotion and marketing of me, right, me and white supremacy that then activated this next chapter? Yeah. I mean, cycles of depression and anxiety and burnout have happened to me throughout the years up until I think, I mean, it's been many, it's been many years now since I, since I've experienced that in a sort of prolonged sense. Um, and I think it, I think one of the great hidden gifts and like the internal gift of white, me and white supremacy for me is how it, um, almost force me to have to do my own inner work around internalized, uh, you know, oppression. And a lot of these ways of showing up in perfectionism, in performing, in um, masking, in imposter syndrome, right? In, in internalized inferiority, came from me really looking at how does white supremacy show up within me? That was some of the hardest work that I had to do was realizing, you know, I am the biggest agent of white of white supremacy in my own experience of myself, right? Because if we were to wake up tomorrow and white supremacy doesn't exist, I would still have this internalized stuff that I've been living with all my life that influences how I think about myself and also how I show up. Mm. Um, and so that has been a great lesson to me. And I can't, in the same way that I think so many people who work through me and white supremacy can't go back to a former version of themselves pre the book, I also can't either. Like I can't unsee ways in which as a black woman, the world expects me to behave and the ways that I have internalized that I think I'm supposed to behave. Right. And so when I actively fight against that, so I'll give you an example. Um, we talk a lot about re- the importance of rest and joy in, um, in become a good ancestor. And that's because I recognize that those two things are things that the world is telling me I'm not supposed to have as a black woman, I'm supposed to overwork and constantly be in a state of trauma. Um, and it's also something that I internalized that I didn't know how to make, how, I didn't know how to let myself rest. I thought I had to overwork to prove that I was worthy, that I belonged. And I believe that joy was something that was frivolous and, um, I had such a visceral, visceral reaction to the word joy that it was like, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Like, this doesn't make sense, right? right? To have to be so angry at the word joy and the, and the idea of allowing myself to be joyful. Um, And so I did my work on that and recognizing like, Mm -hmm. yeah, because you, that's never been given to you as something that you're supposed to have. So that's, you know, that's what writing this book and kind of delivering it has done for me. And then the, um, the piece around the promotion piece. So I, this was pre pandemic, right? It came out, the book came out in 2020, but I did my book tour, two book tours right before the pandemic was announced. So I came home for my second book tour and within three days, the world was in lockdown. And so in that, In those two tours, I mean, the the bigger one was the U.S. one. I toured the U.S. for three weeks straight, basically by myself, um, and went from city to city, almost every day a different city, every day talking about this work. And I'm really glad that I got to have that experience because what I learned through that was actually I'm a lot stronger than I think I am. I'm a lot more capable than I think I am. And I, it allowed me to really own my work um, in a way that, again, I think white supremacy had had me thinking I was an imposter. So going through this almost like a training of like, okay, next day, get on a plane, go to a different city, talk about this work, answer questions, all of that kind of stuff allowed me to really own the work. So I'm grateful for that experience. 
That's phenomenal. Um, and was, was there a specific moment? I mean, it sounds like you gained so much for sure, mm-hmm. but was there ever a specific moment where it also taught you about how to take care of your well being? You touched on how joy felt, you felt anger toward yeah. that, that word. Um, and what was the turning point? And another thing I thought of while you were talking is like, not only as a black woman, have you been given the message that you're not allowed to rest or not allowed to seek or accept joy, but then also being such a publicly known world renowned public figure that, that spotlight of scrutiny and hyper analysis that not only do you have to be perfect as a black woman, but then as a public figure. And so it's like having that multiplied on a whole other level. So what did that teach you about? Because I I can hear how, you know, this work you're doing now to help change makers rest and restore ourselves. There was such a through line in there. Because I believe you learned a lot in that journey as you were promoting and marketing Mm. um, me and white supremacy how, what did that teach you about well-being, rest, mm. joy, and then your next offerings? Yeah. So I shared a post recently on um, Instagram where I talked about this idea of like embracing the soft life. And I was saying that I'm all for that because I, in fact, I feel like year upon year, I'm becoming softer inside. Like something is happening in me where I'm softening but I also really recognize that I'm very strong and that's really important as well. And so holding the both and of I am am a soft woman and I'm also a strong woman and both things exist at the same time. And I've learned sometimes softness is what is called for and sometimes strength is what is called for, right? And so I say that to say, yes, I gained a lot from, you know, both externally and internally writing and promoting and sharing this book, but I also lost a lot, right? Like the experience, I don't want to like romanticize this in any way. Being a black woman writing a book on racism is, is a, it's a practice in reliving trauma, your own trauma and also collective trauma, historical trauma, present day trauma. And that's also part of the reason why I knew the assignment was done because I knew if I continued to do this kind of work in this way, I would be living with trauma as an as a as a normalized part of my life, right? And you know, I can't speak for anyone else who does anti-racism work. I can only speak for myself. That is not something that I wanted. I wanted something more for myself than that. Um, And I really credit the support that I received through mentorship and therapy, teaching me to really expand the vision of what was possible for me and what I could have. Mm. And so, yeah, you know, and we can't, we're not here to do everything alone. And sometimes when we're in it, we need someone who is outside of it to give us perspective Mm -hmm. of what being in it is doing to us, right? Right. And and so that's why it's very important for me to do this work to support change makers, because we give so much of ourselves. We're so passionate about the cause and the call, the work. We know it's important. It is. And we can sacrifice ourselves beyond the point of what is good for us if we're not careful. And so sometimes we need somebody who's gone through it to be like, hey, you know, yes, this work is important. I'm not asking you not to do it, but is the way that you're doing it taking care of you, right? Right. And so the shift from anti-racism to the work that we do in Become a Good Ancestor isn't a rejection of the work of supporting change making. It's a pivot to how could we do this work differently that makes sure that I'm also taken care of while also yes. supporting other people. Right. And and I just I just want people to know like you can pivot, you can shift, mm-hmm. right? You can you can change. And you don't have to abandon what's important to you. You can just choose yeah. to do it differently. Yeah. 
Right. And it's an evolution that helps you protect your well-being and therefore give deeper to the calling. I also think it's more aligned with who I am at my core. Mm. I am at my core an optimistic, idealistic, visionary dreamer. I am very strong, but I am not a I'm not a fighter. Mm. Right? I I'm not a I am not a um I'm not a destroyer, right? And right. I don't use that word it in a disparaging way. I think these systems and these um, paradigms need to be destroyed. So we need destroyers, right? And I, and I know that um, mean white supremacy has helped incredibly with that. But what you know is if you read me and white supremacy, you know, what do I say at the beginning? I say, you'll need three things to do this work, Right. And they, they, funnily enough, they follow the acronym of TLC, right? Yeah. And so mm-hmm. you need you need truth, you need love, and you need commitment. Okay. And so my work has mm-hmm. always been wrapped up in that love, healing, energy. Yes. And so that's who I am at the core. And so it it feels very good to return to the essence of who I am, so that as I'm leading this work. I no longer feel like this is something where um, God is like, hey, I want you to go on this journey, just be the channel for it, right? I actually feel right. like it's more like, I want to co-create, I want to create this thing, God, help me to do it. This is coming from the, my essence now. Mm. Please support me in this work. Um, so it feels it feels very different. That's beautiful. Because what I hear is that Everything you learned in your journey of bringing me and white supremacy into the world, from the Instagram challenge to the viral post, the viral post, the Instagram challenge, and then the writing of the book and the promotion of the book, what I hear is you learned as well the impact of the work on you, and therefore you felt called to then talk to us about how to take care of our well-being whilst being, uh, you know, channels of change in this world. So. Did that then, um, how did you get the idea for this course? Because I feel like there's a connection there. Yeah, yeah. I think the connection as well is like, I was really thinking about, I was thinking about my next stage, like what's my next evolution and how does it make sense within where I've come from, right? I've just finished this assignment. I'm not in a place anymore where I'm like, I have no idea who I am. Let me go study cooking or something. It was like, no, this is this is the work that I'm here to do. And how can I steward this next stage? And so I was thinking of two things. I was thinking about myself, what I'm here to contribute. And I was also thinking about the thousands of people who had either come through my, me and white supremacy or who had been activated by it, right? So they were either in a place where they were like, I want to become an ally or I want to practice allyship or I want to become more of an activist in this work or an advocate in this work. And for me, what I started to think about was like those two terms, like ally and activist, there's nothing wrong with them, but they are things that we do. They're not who we are, right? We are either an ally for a specific group, a marginalized group, or we are an activist for a specific social justice cause. But what I wanted people to do is actually think about who they are. And I started to use this term change makers because that's not something you do. That's who you are. That's that that calling again. And it makes me feel all of these like passionate, excited feelings inside. And I wanted to connect with that within myself. And I wanted to connect with other people who, when they hear that word, they think, Either that is me or that's who I want to be in the world. And so um, the business of Become a Good Ancestor and the course, the courses we have created is how can we support people who are change seekers, who want to become change makers, and who are change makers who want to become sustainable change makers. Mm-hmm. And so for supporting those kind of two groups of people, we have created two offerings. The first is our self-study course that's called Claim Your Space. 
And this is a program. This is our level one program. This is for people who are change seekers. They want to become change makers. They hear that term. It means something to them, but they actually feel like, but I don't really know, like, what is the change that I'm here to make? You know, uh, I know I'm passionate about a lot of causes. I know many things are important. I even know that there are various skills and strengths that I have, but I'm not really focused. And I wanted to help people have focus because distraction is a huge part of how systems of oppression function. If we can be distracted by nonstop horrific traumatic events that are happening in the news, then we don't know how to um, continuously build a body of work and a legacy of work that is going to have meaningful change. We don't know how to be strategic and coordinate with each other and in community to do this work. We're just um, in that overreaction uh, or over um, overstimulated uh, state. Right. Well, it's, a, it's a state of reactiveness as opposed to responsiveness. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for me, Rima, like when something happens in the news, I, that used to be me. That used to be like, oh my God, can't believe this racist thing has happened. I'm going to go post about it. I'm going to go talk about it. I'm, I'm actually going to be in a state of trauma for the next few days. And I don't even realize that that's what I'm signing up for. And I have no plan of how I'm going to take care of myself through this process. I just know I'm fired up and I have to say something. The difference between where I am now is I know what, what we call in the Claim Your Space course is I know what, what my right work is. I know what my right channel is. I have an understanding that the work that I'm doing is helping to fight that thing that I'm so angry about. And so um, my focus is how can I... Uh, how, how can I make sure that I don't allow this thing that's happened to get me into such a spiral state that I forget about the very work that it is that I'm here to do? It's not to say that I don't get angry, I don't get upset, I don't. It does. It doesn't mean that. It just means I'm more strategic. And I think that when we have a when we have claimed our space in our work as change makers. It becomes easier to do that. Um, we know what we're here to do. Uh, this thing happened out there. I'm doing the only thing that I can do right now, which is to focus on this work that is to fight the very roots of that thing. And so we wanted to be able to ha help and support um, aspiring change makers to figure out like, what is your work that you're here to do and how mm -hmm. are you here to do it? And also, how can we support you overcoming a lot of the fears that come up for change makers around, um, you know, using our voices around what will people say about us? What will people think about us? How um, comfortable I am risk taking? Um, and how do I make sure that I'm taking care of myself through this work as well? So we we pack you know those things in there as well because we don't just want to we don't just want you to know okay yeah so I'm here to focus on um, climate change and I'm here to do that through um, you know uh, uh, joining this particular you know cause that's that's supporting that work right. Okay, but then when challenges show up, do you know how to navigate those? Or do they end up scaring you so much that you end up just backing right out of the work, right? How do you navigate right. those moments? So that's what Claim Your Space is about. That's that level one. And then level two is a more targeted program. Um, it's actually a group experience. And it's for people who are in their right work. They know what they're doing. They've, they're maybe, you know, we, we give some examples of where they may be at. They may be coaches, consultants, DEI leads, um, healers, space holders, facilitators, whatever the case may be. They're doing change making work, but the way that they're doing it is is the way that they've set themselves up to do it is almost requiring them to have to sacrifice themselves for the cause. And something that I learned as we've discussed in this journey, something I learned through me and white supremacy was I cannot do that because if I am doing that, I am actually upholding the very thing that I'm trying to fight. 
Completely. And you're going against the very roots of this, which is to be a good ancestor of the legacy of love instilled yes. in you by the ancestors transitioned and li- living. The Absolutely. parents beginning with that. Right. Absolutely. And so I, what I love is everything you've talked about is it's a relationship with this calling. And how do we make this a sustainable relationship? That's right. That's right. And so that's a group experience called Deepen, which will, you know, run a couple of times a a year only. It's not an ongoing evergreen um, thing that people can sign up for. Um, And it's a really beautiful container. You know, it's led by me um, sharing both my experiences and my tools and things that I've learned along the way. And it's also supported by our care team. And these are trauma-informed liberation coaches, because the work of change making can be traumatic, right? We're dealing with the trauma of the world, the collective trauma and our own as well. And we wanted to be able to hold a trauma informed space um, that engages our mind. Yes, engages our heart, but also takes care of our body, right? Takes care of our emotions and kind of makes sure that as a change maker who may be exhausted (laughs) through this work, that you feel nourished in this space, um, that you feel like this is a space that is here to take care of me, protect me, fill me up, help me connect with other change makers on the journey and come out of the container feeling replenished, focused, and having, what I want is for people to walk away with their own blueprint like their own unique blueprint of how they're here to show up as a change maker. Incredible. Yeah. I'm excited about it. Yes. Because it's again, not only offering the tools, but the sustainable practices that allows us to continue to be, to answer to this call. Yes. Yeah. And we need, we need sustainability. We cannot, Mm -hmm. we're not here to, um, to burn bright, for a short while and then fizzle out, right? And that's martyrdom. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And this is change making. Yes. There's a significant difference. Absolutely. Significant difference. Absolutely. And, you know, when it, some of the things that I had to tell myself on the journey, like I love that you use the word martyrdom because I had to tell myself, like, you are not here to martyr yourself at this, like, altar no. of white supremacy, right? That's yeah. not what you were made for. That's not... So what you are created for, right? Yeah. What you're created for is love, right? Is is healing, is joy, is liberation. So how you move in this work is just as important as what you do, right? How you experience yourself, how you be matters just as much as what you do. And I think that's a lot of times the shift that we need and Sometimes we just need to hear it from other people who've been on the path for a while. I think the, I think all of the things that I've been able to experience as somebody who has had a quote unquote big platform have kind of been like, a, what do you call it? Like an incub, you know, like an incubator experience. <laughs> it's like, we're going to throw yeah. all mm-hmm. these things at you <laughs> and you're going to have to figure it out. And I never want my experiences to not serve others. Like why go through it if it's not intended to be of service to others as well? Um, So that's what I'm hoping to do through this work. Thank you, Layla. Well, you are doing this work. That's exactly what you're giving us. And how you give is part of what you give. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And it is all love. It's all love. And as uh, on our closing note, I would love for you to send out a message. What's your call to action to our audience? Yeah. I can't, I can't think of a more special thing. For you I love that. Cause I'm like, like yeah, seeing my, I'm yes. seeing myself like <laughs> on a hill with like a torch and I'm like calling all the change makers. You know? yes, <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. Anybody who hears that term and goes, that's me. Something jumps in your heart mm-hmm. and says, me, 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 I'm here to do that. Like, I want to call out to those people and say, let's go on this journey together, right? And mm. and the first place that I want to invite people into is our program, Claim Your Space, because I truly believe mm. 
We have to know what it is that we're here to do and how it is that we are here to do it. Like that is ground zero foundation must know, right? That's important so we don't get distracted, we don't get confused, we don't we don't give up because we don't know what we're actually fighting for and why, right? Like mm-hmm. that's the first level. And um I I think that the more we are activated in that understanding of like this is my space, I have claimed my space, the 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 um the greater uh, longevity that we have, right? And the more focus that we have as good ancestors. So please do join us for Claim Your Space if this sounds like something that resonates um, with you. It is a, an evergreen um, course that's always available at becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash claim dash your dash space. And I think it is something that will help so many people lay the groundwork for the legacy that they are here to create. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Layla. It has been an honor and a joy to talk to you and to hear about all of this exciting, exciting growth. I, it is such a privilege to know you. It is such a gift to love you. Thank you. I love you too, friend. I am so grateful that we get to journey together, um, that we get to do this work together, um, that we get to be on, on, you know, on each other's teams really, and supporting and cheerleading for one another. And, you know, it just really speaks to the power of community, finding your Mm -hmm. right people, you know, that you're here to connect with and journey with. And, um, Every person that is a part of Team Good Ancestor is such a bright light, and all the people that are coming into the offerings that we're that we're um, that we're offering is I just know that they're mm-hmm. attracted to that light. So thank you for being mm-hmm. the light that you are, because it, <sighs> it the light you know that saying the light in me sees the light in you, right? Light. And it really does. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It really does. To our work as good ancestors and change makers. Thank you, dear Layla, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We will see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed learning about today's author and their incredible work. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave us some love with a rating and review. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts including YouTube. And of course, don't forget to buy the book we talked about today. We're on a mission to center and celebrate BIPOC authors, and you can help us do that by sharing this episode and the book. You can join us in our book club to dive deeper into today's book. Visit becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash book club to find out more. For more inspiration and learning, you can find us at becomeagoodancestor.com and become underscore a underscore good underscore ancestor on Instagram. Thank you for being on the journey with us as we strive to become good ancestors in honor of those who have come before us and in service to those who will come after we are gone.